Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 78, They Can't All Be Great, Dealing with a Game Night Failure. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight we are talking about what to do when your game night bombs. We've also got a review of the Legacy of Lopan expansion for Big Trouble in Little China. And we both got a ton of games to talk about in our Bellhops tabletop segment. Uh, highlights include Orléans with Trade and Intrigue, Goris Maximus, Medium, Imhotep with a New Dynasty, Azul Summer Pavilion, War Chest, Pulsar 2849, 8-Bit Box, and Raiders of the North Sea with Hall of Heroes. Plus, I've even got an RPG to talk about as we actually made characters for Dungeon Crawl Classic with my Monday Night Group. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folks. We'll share some of the feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. Well, with Valentine's Day coming, our two-player date night post is getting a lot of attention. Amanda writes, we love Farkle. All you need is six dice. I have several sets lying around in various purses and bags. Uh, thanks, Amanda. You know, I've never actually played Farkle physically. Like, I played an app, and I think I had it on my, my iPod Touch. And I played, like, Facebook had a Farkle thing back when I used to play games on Facebook before I know better and don't waste nearly as much time. Um, but I've never actually sat down and rolled dice at a table with people and played Farkle. Though it is a solid game. I remember I've had way more fun with that than any of the Yahtzee apps or anything like that. It's a solid game. And more date night game re recommendations from Keith K. Davies. Acro Tiri is a pretty good two-player game. One Deck Dungeon is a good game too, but hard enough I'm not prepared to try and play it with my wife. Chocolatiers looks like another good choice, though I've only read it, not played it. Well, thanks for the comments, Keith, uh, and game recommendations. We'll toss all those in the show notes. Uh, Acro Tiri is not one I've tried, but One Deck Dungeon, I don't, not more complicated for us, but I, it's not going to be great for my wife and I. Now, some people may love it, but Deanna, actually more than, Deanna more than I, really doesn't like um, push your luck style games. Uh, what's the, the term she likes to always say is I like to be control of my, in control of my own fate. And with a push your luck game, like, yeah, all you're deciding is do I keep going or not? You're not, you know, it's all generally random. So that's not one for us, but for people who dig it, thumbs up. Now, Chocolatiers, I got to say the theme is on point, like perfect. Chocolatiers for date night game, Valentine's Day in particular, right? But it's not really good with two players because the scoring in that game is area majority or uh, based on set collection. And those really work better with three or more players. Well, continuing with the same topic, Mike Robinson writes, Magic the Gathering is best for date night. Chess is a better two-player game, but no one wants hard feelings on Valentine's Day. Ah, uh, thanks for the comment, Mike. I gotta say, it sounds, sounds kind of backwards to me, because while I can see chess being good for the right couple, I, I've never seen it being all that cutthroat. Now, we personally prefer chess-like games, like the Duke. I personally love the Duke compared to playing chess. But as for Magic, I find those dueling card games to be really competitive, almost over-competitive. And I'm pretty sure if you're going to start playing one of those dueling card games, you may have to worry about someone sleeping on the couch. But if competition's what gets you fired up, all the power to you. Now, one final date night comment from James Michael Spawn. I freaking love two-player abstracts in particular. My collection is small, though. Onitama, the Duke... Swords and Strongholds, Mage Stone, and a few historic ones as well. Nefetafel, Aegon, and the like. I'm right there with you, James. I gotta say, what's cool here is learning that James is actually into this stuff, because James is an OSR RPG guy to me. 
Uh, he's the genius behind the White Star role-playing system, which we reviewed over on the blog if you want to check that out. Very old-school sci-fi. You can play Firefly, Star Wars, Star Trek with it. I had no clue that he even did like non-RPG gaming, so that's pretty cool. Um, we actually had a conversation that kept going on Facebook where he's trying to find a copy of an Igon, A-G-O-N board, uh, otherwise known as Queen's Guard or Royal Guards. This is an abstract game on a big hexagonal board filled with more hexes and concentric rings going out. And they're in different colors. And then there's some other colored spots on the edges. I got to admit, I don't know the game, but I was just trying to find him a, co uh, a board. And while I did find a couple sources, all of them were in the UK. I couldn't find anything here. And they were all rather ridiculously priced. So if anyone out there knows where James can get an egg on board, let me know and I'll pass it on. Now jumping to last week's topic, of board games for a war gamer who doesn't want to get back into army collecting. Stuntman writes, The games that I own play like war games are 1812, The Invasion of Canada, and Cry Havoc. 1812 uses just cubes. It actually reminds me of Axis and Allies a bit because it is 3 verse 2. There is only one type of unit for each player. Movement is limited to the movement cards you play. It adds that limited movement feel of Memoir 44, where you cannot move everything you want any way you want. Combat is like Axis and Allies, where each side rolls uh, dice back and forth until one side is killed, routed, or decides to retreat, if possible. Now, Cry Havoc is more of an area control game. You try to control areas to give you victory points. You are not trying for certain strategic victory conditions. The combat is handled in a very interesting way. There is no dice rolling. Combat is resolved in a deterministic way. If you have two battles where troops are alloc allocated the same way, the end result will always be the same. What can change the outcome are combat cards each player may play. The combat card adds some uncertainty because you don't know what cards your opponent may play. When you fight a battle, there are three different combat objectives you can try and go for. One objective is to just try and kill enemy troops. Another is to try and capture the territory where the combat is taking place. And the last is to take prisoners. It is possible that different sides win different combat objectives in a battle. It's the most interesting combat system I've seen. Well, thanks, Stuntman. Uh, two fantastic recommendations there. I personally can't believe I forgot the Revolution game series from Academy Games when we did last week's show. And even like I did the blog post a couple days later, it should have been on that list. I am a big fan of that series, and of all of the ones I've tried, 1812 is my personal favorite, so I'm right there with you. Now, as for Cry Havoc, now this, again, this is a game with miniatures, so if you are totally looking to get away from miniatures, this isn't going to work, but this is one of those games where the miniatures are just there to represent the pieces. Everything you need comes in the box, no assembly, nothing like that. You, actually, you have to put the colored bases on the bottom of them to show which player owns which, and all the units are the same. Like, you just have a mini to represent one of your units. It's not like there's different types. Um, it is a great folk on a map game, and as Stuntman points out, it does have one of the most unique combat systems that are out there. Uh, one of the most unique I've actually seen in a game. The closest that comes to it is Rising Sun, but they're different enough that, that they're still unique. All right. Well, another war game recommendation comes from DH Vlad at Scared Emmy on Twitter. Rivet Wars does this pretty well and is great for getting kids introduced <laughs> to it. Nice list. Thanks, DH. Uh, this is another one I didn't even think of. Now, Rivet Wars, though, is definitely a miniature game, more so than Cry Havoc and everything. It, it's lots of miniatures uh, now and different miniatures for different unit types, and it has tanks and it has infantry and stuff like that. The really unique look, all the, the characters, uh, Chibi is probably as close as I can get to it or super deformed, but they're actually rivets. That's thus Rivet Wars with the little helmets. Really unique look to the game. The thing with this, though, is you only need the base box to play. But I think anyone who enjoys this game is going to be tempted to go out and pick up many of the expansions that are out there. And once you're at the point that you're buying more for your army, you're basically back to armor building. Now, Rivet Wars, all the minis do come assembled. So there's no none of the hobby aspects, and you don't need to paint them. Uh, it is a really solid system, though. I just don't know if it's the best recommendation if you're trying to avoid the miniature side of the hobby. It's a very fast and furious game where you're rushing to get control points and constantly spawning new units onto the board. It's almost like a tower defense on two sides where your two forces are rushing to, to, towards each other, trying to control command points on the map. Actually, a very neat game, one that uh, Cool Mini or not actually sent us for an extra life event, which is the only reason I got to try it. I w probably wouldn't have touched it in the first place thinking it's a miniature game, but having played it, I actually can strongly recommend it as a light war game. All right. Well, finally, we'll finish off with Jeremy, who has a bunch more miniature light war game recommendations. 
a few others to mention. Mobile Frame Zero, another LEGO system, it's free. Star Breach, sci-fi battles, use whatever minis you want, free. Mm-hmm. Battle Lore, the board game, hard to find expansions. Gaslamp, grab some Hot Wheels and go all Mad Max. Root, battle for the woodlands. And Relic Blade. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, this comment came on the blog, so he mentions Mobile Frame Zero. We did talk about that on the actual podcast. I just skipped over it when I was writing the thing. So Mobile Frame Zero is definitely one I'm aware of. I actually backed that one on Kickstarter. Star Breach, I don't know, but uh, we'll be sure to drop a link in the show notes. But That's another one of those, like that Fubar Sean had found, where it's a universal system. You can use any minis, which is cool. Uh, Gaslands, man, there's we should have thought of that one. Um, I played Gaslands at Extra Life, thanks to um, semi-local gamer Dave Garby brought it down. Uh, head over to Wargaming Tradecraft to he- see his stuff. Uh, great game because, yeah, you have a miniature, but you can use any Hot Wheels or Matchbox car. That's it. Like, you can go, you know, steal one off your kids, or if you still got one from when you were a kid, or go to the dollar store and get one. Uh, of course, people are going to probably want to customize them and paint them, but you don't need to. And then Root. Um, that took me a minute. Like, I saw Root, and I was like, oh, Root, that's a Euro game. But no, really, it's not, right? Uh, Root is... Despite its forest and cute animal themes and Carl Fer- Kyle Farron art, actually a counterinsurgency war game, uh, part of the Coin series of games you usually see from GMT Games. Uh, that probably should been on the list. I probably wouldn't have thought of that, but just Coin games in general, like Fire in the Lake being one of the most well-known ones representing the Vietnam War. Those are some of the most asymmetric games ever made, where every faction actually has its own victory conditions. So no, thumbs up. Good recommendation with Root. Definitely no minis required. It's just people, little cute cats and birds, all warring in the forest. Relic Blade, um, that's one of those small skirmish level miniature games. There are a ton of those out there, to be honest. Um, pretty much in every setting, the um, War Machine used to be one of these. They seem to be leaning towards the army size of nowadays. But yeah, games where you probably have like less than 10 units. It's a cool alternative to collecting a full army. For, for myself, over the years, more time would be my game of choice, which is a Warhammer Fantasy Battle distilled down to a small war band of fantasy characters fighting over, uh, over in a medieval city, basically, or a Warhammer city. That's actually the only game where I have a fully painted army because my army is nine units. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat rooms at the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell for the after show. All right, tonight we are talking about what to do when game nights go wrong. So a couple things I would love to see from our lobby tonight. Uh, One is their suggestions on how to handle a disaster, possibly specific to whatever situation we're talking about later. Possibly, too, I wouldn't mind seeing some horror stories where game nights did go wrong. So if you don't want to talk, you don't have to share names. That's all perfectly fair. Absolutely. We can we can talk in generalities. We don't need yeah. to uh, call anyone out directly on a exactly. international podcast. And Scatter Brains, welcome to the chat. That's a new name I don't recognize. And yeah, war, Root is a great war game. I have heard that. I've heard that many times. I just have not had a chance to uh, try the game. Unfortunately, I don't have a contact with Leader Games myself to get a review copy, and it's just not in my budget currently. One of these days, Neil will probably teach me how to play Root, because I know he loves it. We should uh, get him to make sure it comes to uh, Extra Life, at least. <laughs> yeah, They're just fitting it in with everything else. All right, what else we got in the chat? All right, not too much uh, going on in the chat just yet. We had a uh, chat earlier on about uh, some beer, and uh, <laughs> we, we started, unfortunately, discussing taxes, because that time is uh, yes. drawing near. But uh, we don't need to fo- uh, deal with something like that. We have good topics uh, about the way you think ways things go bad without taxes. So yeah, for taxes, uh, I always like the meme that like uh, t- doing my taxes has been easier ever since I started dropping off at the local board gaming group and telling him it's an economic strategy game. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sure it would work. We'll just like convince Charles to do our taxes for us. There you go. All right. Well, we'll check back into the lobby again after. Ask the Bellhop. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. 
Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they get logged. They go on my Gmail and they're not going to get lost. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, tonight we've got a question from patron of the show, Math Guy Dave. How do you deal with game night failure? Bad RPG session or a game that players didn't enjoy? Maybe even drama between players. Well, thanks for the excellent question and for supporting the show, Dave. Dave's been an active member of the Discord. He uh, popped in here earlier. I'm not sure if he's still around, but he is a part of the growing community building up there in Discord. It's much appreciated. Yeah, I was going through my question list. I'm like, oh, I know that name. <laughs> All right. First off, the, the first thing everyone should be well aware of is that bad game nights are going to happen. Uh, there is no way. Every game night is going to be a great one. No matter how much time and focus you put into it, no matter how many game nights you've already hosted, no matter how many events you've attended, no matter how many great podcasts offering gaming advice you listen to, things do go wrong. We've talked about aspects of this, particularly with kids and trying to teach from an early age how to handle things like losing or unenjoyable games, but many of us didn't get that sort of training, instead being brought up in a more of a Monopoly table flip generation. Yeah, table flip is never the answer. All right, when things go bad, realize it's not the end of the world. One thing I try to always remind people about gaming and game night, when I'm at game nights on this podcast multiple times, is that it's meant to be a fun way to spend time with your friends and other gamers. While we're all gaming together to share social experiences and enjoy the game and each other's company, no matter what happens, it's only a game. It's a pastime. It's not actually important in the grand scheme of things. Now, I'm not trying to devalue the importance of gaming or play. Play is very important on many social and psychological levels. I'm just saying that compared to the other things that can go wrong, a bad game night is pretty low on the hierarchy of bad stuff. Well, unless your game night goes really off the rails, but I think we're going to assume that no one gets knifed at this game night or otherwise requires hospitalization. Yeah, in that case, your solution is just 911 as quick as possible and get to a safe spot. All right, let's get into some specifics of what to do when certain things go wrong. How to handle a few distinct situations. But first, please note, I'm no psychologist, neither is Sean. We aren't doctors, though we may play one in a tabletop RPG. Uh, this advice here is based on personal experiences, what's worked and what hasn't for us, as well as listening to, reading, and consuming a variety of gaming advice from others over the years and hearing what works for others and doesn't for them. What we suggest here may not be what's right for your group. Know your players. You know your players better than we do. And that last part is really the most important part. Know your players, as the better you know them, the more you can avoid or easily minimize the problems that we're going to go into here. All right, we'll start with board games, or card games, miniature games, non-RPGs, where you're not playing characters, you're not playing a campaign. Uh, what do you do when this goes bad? Now, that's going to depend on exactly what happens. So we're going to put aside the people problem completely for now. We will get to them eventually. Same thing when we talk about RPGs. We're not talking about problem players at this point. We're talking about things going wrong in the game. For example, well, I guess it's a people problem, but someone's not enjoying the game, but not because of the other players. It's just they don't like the game. The game you're playing is broken. It happens. The, the, there's a fundamental rule problem. There's something that doesn't work. You have a runaway leader. Like, there is no way anyone's going to win. Deanna's got the game, and you can tell halfway through. You can't figure out the rules. This happens. You, you got the rule book in front of you. You're playing, and it's just not working. Or you figure out halfway through, you've been playing with a rule wrong. And other situations like this. So that's just, we're trying to, this is probably the broadest category, right? Something goes wrong in the game and you're at that point, what do you do? Well, in these cases, you always have the option to start, stop the game and either start over or play something else. We mentioned this multiple times on the podcast. It's all, it should be one of the Bellhop's rules at this point. We reiterate it so much. There are, is no need to finish every game you start. And yes, we know it's hard. It's really hard to do. There's the thing called the sunk time fallacy that sit there telling you that if you quit, everything we've done up to that point was wasted. Like we, if I don't finish it, I've wasted my time. Well, you know what? So is finishing the game you're not enjoying. It's just as much a waste of time. 
Now, I know for a fact this is something that Mo has a problem with, in part because as a reviewer, it's his job to see where things are broken oh. and see it through to the end. Um, and I got caught recently in an online play of Through the Ages where I kept thinking that I could find some enjoyment or figure out a way out of the hole I dug when four turns earlier I should have bowed out and that would have been more enjoyable for me and for the other two players who had to watch me descend into uh, the, the deficit of points, especially when that game in particular has a mechanic yeah. to extract oneself from a game built in. But even if the game doesn't have a mechanic to stop, you can still stop it. The thing, though, is make sure everyone is on the same page. Pause the game and ask the group. Uh, so many of these problems that we're going to mention tonight can be solved just by talking. Is everyone still having fun? Like, if you notice people are having fun, ask. It looks like Dave's the winner. It's, no matter what we do, Dave's going to win. Do we still want to finish the game, or do we just want to give it to Dave and then maybe play another round? Or, okay, now that we figured out we have played the first 15 rounds of this game completely wrong, and now we know how it works, you want to start over? Since we totally flubbed this one. Stuff like that, right? Have that conversation. Yep. Now, watch people and watch people's reactions and where their attentions are. This goes not only for the host, but everyone at the table. We all got caught up in ga get caught up in games, so we should all try and remember to pay attention to one another and watch for those signs that someone is checking out or frustrated or just plain hating it. All right, the next situation uh, hypothetically I came up with is one or more of the players are eliminated from the game, but the game's still going. This isn't as common with most modern hobby games, but it's definitely a thing with older games. Now, this may be a reason to stop the game because so many people have been eliminated, but that's probably not what the entire group is going to want to do. And again, you have that conversation. This in particular, though, is why I like to pack quick filler games to game nights. Something to give people to do between games. So one of the ones, despite the fact I'm not a huge lover of the game, is Suro. Because it's a little click and light, but it's perfect for this because it plays up to eight players. And it's really simple to play and really simple to teach. And I can take less than five minutes from the game we're currently playing to show the eliminated players how to play Suro. Other games like that, like two-player abstracts, I also find really good for that, like the Duke or Santorini, which is a three-player abstract that, again, is fairly simple to teach. Or kids' games, stuff like Rhino Hero, can be great to easily distract the eliminated players while the rest of the players finish the game. Just try and ensure that the eliminated players aren't going to pull focus from the main game. <laughs> you don't want people looking over longingly at the Rhino Tower while well, wishing they were over there and not still playing whatever. <laughs> Very true. Uh, another thing to make sure is let people know they don't have to stick around if they don't want to. Now, this is more applies to, again, we're still talking about player elimination, games with player elimination. If you're playing a big epic game, one of those all night, all weekend, 12 hour extravaganzas, your advanced civilizations, your bigger war games, your 4X games, your Twilight Imperiums, right? While it may be fun for you to sit through the final four hours of Twilight Imperium after getting eliminated in the first two, that may not be for everyone. You might want to stick and see who betrays who and where it goes. But you know what? Uh, maybe it's time to check out and head home. This is also true for shorter games, even. Someone may not want to wait 45 minutes for the next game to start if they have other things they could be doing in an event. We recently had this happen in an easy mode event where we played a game with a, with a couple and then they we're kind of stuck in the limbo while everything else was going on and they chose to leave, which is perfectly fine. And that's something to really try and clarify in advance, probably even before people arrive on a organized game night, but certainly before starting in on some real heavyweight games with long play times, if there's going to be player elimination, clarify what's available if people will choose to stay, mm -hmm. but also that no one will be upset if you choose to go somewhere else. All right, moving on to another problem. While all companies try to write the perfect rule book and make their rules clear, no one is out there actually trying to obfuscate the rules. Rule disagreements can come up. We've got an entire episode about what to do when you've got a bad rule book. This is episode 29. And this can be a problem. Like it can be a terrible rule book, or sometimes it can be a great rule book, but rule questions still come up because not every rule book is going to cover every possible situation in the game. Now, thankfully, we live in the future, being 2020 right now, and 99% of the time, 
An answer is just a Google search away. This is actually what I recommend groups do if something like this comes up. Head over to Board Game Geek. That's probably the best place. Look up the game or look for an official FAQ and find an answer for whatever the rule problem is. Go with the actual official reply on the official FAQ and continue playing. Yeah, now often a game in, in and of itself uh, is, is, can be made as everyone races to find the answer first or works to disambiguate the various answers that are found when there's no official FAQ to, uh, to be found. Yeah, no official FAQ comes up, unfortunately, a little more frequently than I'd like. So let's say you can't find the right answer, right? So then it's up to the group to come to a consensus. As I mentioned before, one of the main solutions to many of these problems is communication. I, if coming to a consensus is a problem for your group, I do suggest one of two things. One's really simple. You're all gamers. Roll a die or use some other randomizer or do some type of vote on who on, on what ruling is correct. And if you're worried about hurt feelings, do the vote blind. Like have everyone go, okay, is rule one or two? Write it down, one or two on a scrap of paper. Shuffle them up, count them up. That way no one's insulted that someone went against them or not. The important thing, though, is no matter what the result is, stick to it. Rules for games should not be mutable. Now, again, we're talking board games, RPGs, or a different story. Board games have rules, distinct rules, and there's none of the silly stuff like, well, it doesn't say I can't. Well, it doesn't say I can't punch you in the face either, right? I, that, that particular excuse I've heard too many times at game nights for someone behaving badly. Um, stick with the get rules. Whatever your ruling is at the time, that becomes the rule for the rest of the game for sure, and probably the rest of the game night. And if you have a regular group, you probably want to make a note of what that rule was and throw it in the box so that it becomes the rule from then on. Then after the game night's done, though, do some research, right? Like if you're the owner, I, I would suggest whoever owns the game do this, but whoever, whoever the alpha gamer in the group is, Go home and, and check, is there a proper answer? And if there isn't, that's where you post on Board Game Geek, right? Or send an email to the designer or tag them on Twitter. Like, all these things are pretty easy to do nowadays. Heck, we have game designers that show join our live chats on our podcast now. So we, we get feedback is, is easier to get than ever nowadays. Yeah. Now, one thing to watch, don't spend too much time on it, uh, especially if you have a short game night. Especially if you're meeting for three or less hours, don't like like 15, 10 minutes, maybe even five might be long enough. Like if you don't find it after a quick Google search, if you look on board game, don't see in like every game has a rules forum. If you don't see it in the rules forum on board game geek, which will only take you a few minutes to look at, you're probably spending too long. Just come up with a quick fix, move on, and then again, do the research later. Yeah, I would say about five minutes is probably right. I know I a couple of times when playing uh, DC deck builder with my kids. You know, every once in a while, you get one of those card combinations where you're like, wait a second, can this actually be as stupidly powerful as I think it is? Um, and sometimes you don't get an answer. Uh, you know, again, because I'm playing with my kids, I usually default to the non-stupidly powerful yeah. version and then go look it up later. But uh, it's it's actually something that I have realized I don't always go and deal with again afterwards if I haven't found the answer during um, so, you know, maybe keep a notepad nearby or, or, or mm -hmm. use your phone and write down the note that, hey, we need to look up this rule because, you know, a couple hours later, you're probably not going to remember that you had that uh, problem in the first place. Uh, and it may happen easily again the next time. Yeah. So uh, if possible, continue playing as much as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless the questions resolution prevents all forward motion of the game, but that's generally a pretty rare instance, or if it does, many others will probably have had that same problem, so it should be an easier answer. Yeah, it's it's very seldom nowadays we can't find an, an official answer. Note on Board Game Geek, though, to watch for what an official answer is, because you will get all kinds of people yeah, commenting. You will get a lot of non-official people yes. discussing well, well, a problem without an actual answer. Yeah, watch watch for official FAQs and the actual designers to chime in. All right, moving on to the next problem. What if you show up and no one knows what to play? There's too many games. This happens all the time in my own basement. We got you covered on that one. Uh, this one we've covered already. We got an entire episode, entire blog post about it. Uh, that's episode 53. Uh, there we discussed a ton of options, including the host picks because they're hosting, so that's their privilege. Uh, a few different voting systems and even some online options like board game menu. Just check out that episode and the associated article for even more options. But what I will reiterate here is very similar to what we just talked about. Don't take too long. You don't want picking the game to play to be the game for that night. Uh, try to get something to the table as quickly as possible. Get people gaming right away. Yeah. 
uh, another instance where prep in advance can sidestep these issues and prevent it from becoming a bad game night. Yes. All right, jumping over to the RPG side for, for a little while here. Personally, I think having a bad RPG session just isn't as desire as, as dire, sorry, not as desire, as dire as having a bad board game, having a board game go bad. Because when board games go bad, it's done, right? The game's done. Uh, unless you're running a one shot, because then your RPG shot. But off nights are pretty much par for the coast for most RPG campaigns. They're going to happen. Um, they're going to be there just along with the memorable nights your group never forgets and talks about 10 years later. While most RPG sessions go bad, you just move on, right? Oh, that wasn't the best session tonight. It wasn't great. There's always the next session to get back things on track. And the other benefit of RPGs is there's that downtime in between, right? So you can analyze what went wrong and make sure it didn't happen again. Yeah, bad nights uh, in this vein are things like uh, TPK, quest failures, item loss, things the whole group can commiserate about. The paladin lost their holy relic broadsword. Maybe the bard has something they can offer until they can find a replacement. Just make sure it's not that one with a demon in the hill. <laughs> or make sure it is. All right, most of the situations I have mentioned above can happen in RPGs. Most of the tabletop situations we mentioned. And the solutions are basically the same, right? If players aren't having fun, consider stopping the game. Though again, with an RPG, it's a little different because the players as a group, uh, with the GM possibly having more control over this, depending on your group dynamic, is you can change the game you're currently playing. Like, I don't mean change it, like switch to a different game. I mean, change what's happening in the game, right? If the players aren't having fun shopping for gear, jump to the next scene. Or if they're getting really frustrated by the fact they haven't found a clue that need, it needs to happen to move the game on, you have an NPC offer it to them. Or they just find the clue. Right, like it does. They don't need to make that roll that they've been trying for eight hours. It's modern role playing nowadays, right? You don't call for a die roll for something that can stop the plot dead. All choices should go somewhere. Um, characters aren't people aren't enjoying the players. Characters they made. Players aren't enjoying the characters they made. There. Uh, this happens, right? It happens more often. And there was an old school thing where, like, once you put it on the sheet, it was written in stone. I've never, ever Sean's played in my games. You've been playing your same character for six months and you suddenly go, you know what? I've had this sweep for six levels and I've never used it. Do you mind if I swap it? Yes, please swap it. Go for it. Change that character. Player fun is way more fun, more more important in an RPG than for similitude or simulation. We've never been the type to be rules lawyers in, in our games. Uh, if the dice aren't being conned, maybe don't roll for things that are required to avoid, advance the plot. The whole party standing around while the roll, while the rogue rolls endlessly to try and disarm the trap and open the door isn't going to be an enjoyable experience. Yeah, the, the most game designers nowadays have learned, right? You don't have that stop, that wall, right? There's an entire rule system based on the fact this was a problem in Call of Cthulhu, called Trail of Cthulhu, where you always find the clue automatically, right? Make sure things keep moving. All right, rule disputes. We talked about it with board games. Same deal here, in my opinion. You could look it up the same way you could a board game rule book. And I know there are a bunch of RPG people out there, including rule books, they're going to call heresy on this. I know people say, don't break the immersion, don't stop the game to look up rules, just make a ruling and keep going. I, that's never been me. Personally, I don't mind taking a break to look through the rules. I like to run my RPGs raw, like rules as written. Again, not really a rules lawyer, but I like to stick to the rules because the person who created the game put the rules there for a reason. And to me, the rules in an RPG represent the physics of the world the characters are in. And if it's not consistent, you can't play your characters properly because you don't know how things are going to happen every time if the rules keep changing. Now, it's a personal belief I have for RPGs, and I know not everyone agrees with me, but I personally, we stop the game. We look it up. Like, who cares? you got to flip through some books. Now it's a chance for people to use the washroom, to sit there and, you know, tally up their gold, to go grab a snack or whatever. And again, like with board games, some folks will enjoy the race to be the one to find the right answer on paragraph yep. three of page 47 of book six of the, you know, whichever. Mm -hmm. It's a game. Yep, it's a game. Plus, nowadays, almost everything's in PDF and searchable, too. So it's not quite the same as it used to be where you're going through your tomes of D&D &D books to look up that one obscure rule. All right. Now, those are the, the, the liked problems, we'll call them. There are a few things that could go wrong that can ruin an entire campaign. Now, there is a ton of advice out there on these situations, and we're only going to barely scratch the surface here, because each of these topics have had multiple blog posts, podcast episodes dedicated to each one of them. If you're looking for more advice beyond what we cover here, it's out there. That said, if any 
part of this, anyone wants us to deep dive later during an episode, feel free to let us know, and we'll consider it a topic for a future show. Ooh. All right, going to start off with the dreaded TPK. For anyone who doesn't know what that means, it means total party kill. What do you do when all the characters die during a campaign game? It happens. Uh, one, of, one of the things Shauna mentioned before is pre-planning. Don't let that happen. That could be your solution ahead of time. But let's say it does. What, what, whatever, based on the system you're playing, how you play, let the dice fall where they may. Everyone dies. Well, we're back to the, the, the basics here. Have a conversation with the group. Right then, right there. Say, hey, everyone died. What are we going to do? Uh, this, to me, isn't something that should be decided by the GM. This should be the entire group, the entire team. All of the players at the table, including the DM, should be talking to determine part of the solution to what happens next. Now, to be proper, to be proactive, to use a overused term, this can be done before the campaign even starts, during session zero, and that might be the best option, right? Have a plan in place. What do we do if we have a TPK? And decide ahead of time. Now, Bob I'll admit... Junior, on the end of all your character names, and years later, another party comes across <laughs> the belongings of the first, sworn from infancy to avenge the loss of the first of their names. It's a game. <laughs> have fun with it. Yeah. Or find something else that's fun. Whatever you end up doing. I, again, this goes back to the board game advice. Either... You, you keep playing, or you move on to something else. Maybe you make new characters ready to avenge the old ones, as Sean said. Maybe you play hirelings, NPCs, or other associates of the main characters and continue their quest. Maybe you make a new party, but stay with the same game world and events. Having the death of the characters impact that campaign, so it's now an event that happened in that game world. Personally, I like that because then you get the, the end story of those characters and you get to see the impact they had. Or maybe it's a chance to start a whole new campaign with a new world, maybe even a new system, or even a new DM or GM. Now, this is one I particularly like in this case, because I got to say, you know what? TPKs can be, I hate using this word because some people take it too seriously, but traumatizing. Like, it, it can be a shock to the system. It can be a damaging is not the right word, but, like, people don't always take it well, and it's understandable. And this isn't just the player whose character died. This can be hard on the GM. And maybe this is a good chance to give everyone a break, change things around, and move as far away from as possible that original campaign by giving that GM a break and letting someone else take on the lead. If you've been, uh, you know, playing D and D uh, adventurers leagues and you all get wiped out, go and play some Cyberpunk twenty twenty or play a Shadow Elf cyber thingy. <laughs> cyber Elf Shadow thingy. That, that, that'll be our new uh, our new cyberpunk playing game. There you go. All right. A similar problem happens when one or more players drops out of the game for whatever reason. Um, we covered this somewhat, like not directly, but in our absentee player episode. That was just a few weeks back in episode 74. Uh, but that was more about players not making it for one or two sessions. When someone leaves a game for good, you need something more permanent than most of the stuff we suggested then, though some of it's valid. Now, this could mean ending the game as we just talked about, right? With the same, have a conversation and decide if you're going to end it or not. But more likely, it just involves the GM or the group, if it's a shared GM role, modifying the story, right? Like just twisting it a bit, modify the story and the plot. Um, personally, I prefer if there's an in-game reason for the characters to fade from focus or go out with a bang, whichever way you go. Like I'm all for the heroic sacrifice, right? Someone leaves the game, especially if you can pre-plan it. If you know they're leaving, give them that big bang before they go. But if not, have this something dramatic happen that where that character leaves a mark on the world. Though, if players are leaving under less favorable circumstances, which does happen, it may just be better to have them fade to black and continue the story as if they were never there. Yeah, this is one that's very reliant on the situation and really requires each situation to be handled uh, individually and maturely, carefully based on the people involved and bo the events both in real life and in mm -hmm. the game leading up to the departure. Now, losing players could mean uh, a more dramatic change for your group because you may not have enough people left to continue the game. Now, in this case, again, you could end the game or move on to something that works with less players, or it might be a chance to recruit new players. Now, player recruiting is an entirely different topic and not one we're going to dive into tonight. But we have touched on it in some previous episodes, but of course you'd listen to them all by now, right? Of course. 
right from episode one. So I don't recommend going back that far. Though we did cover some good stuff. All right, a different aspect of this is character death, not player death, character death. Though player death, we basically just covered with the one above. Um, there's where you really want to have a character go out with a bang. Um, just one or two characters die, not the whole party, right? Not a TPK. Uh, this is similar to having a player leave, except you don't have to worry about the group getting too small, right? You still got everyone there. In most cases, this is just a matter of the GM adjusting the story and the plot, right? Take into account the current character's death, add in any new characters the players make, and keep things moving. Now, what can be more difficult is how well the players handle their character deaths, which leads us to dealing with player drama. And this is really, I think, the, the main topic here in some ways. Uh, so much of the other aspects can be handled with a little bit of pre-planning, your session zero, your pre-game chat. But uh, we hope that our friends and fellow players are mature enough to deal with most of the issues in a reasonable manner. Mm -hmm. The fact is we all have off days. We may not know what another person has going on in other aspects of their life. And for whatever, for whatever reason, in the moment, things may become problematic. Yeah, we're all humans, right? I hope so. Or even if we're not, we probably still all have our emotional beings. No Vulcans playing at my table. Um, we're, we're all playing these games together, and sometimes our emotions can get the better of us. Tempers flare, people get hurt and upset. In-game conflict becomes out-of-game conflict. And sometimes RPG characters' feelings lead into real life. Actually, especially when you get into, like, LARPing and that, the bleed is a real, actual thing that happens. And people talk about that. Sometimes emotions can be a mess, and they can ruin a game night. Now, ideally, again, while you may not be able to avoid this with a session zero mm -hmm. uh, or a, or a pregame chat, what you can do is establish some ground rules on how, mm -hmm. as a group, you want to handle it when it comes up. Because I don't think anyone should assume that, oh, well, we're just not going to have problems like that. A character <laughs> die, a character die. No, no. Things happen, you know? Maybe one of the members in the party was just recently divorced and they've been bottling it all up because, you know, you're all gaming friends, but you don't really talk about real life. Well, when something in-game happens, that could trigger some real emotions that they've been bottling up and need to get out. And as a group, while you may not need to prepare for specifically that exact circumstance, you should be prepared that, look, one of our players has a problem. That's more important than what else is going on right now. Yeah, definitely. All right, so let's say things go bad, right? People have gotten upset. I, it doesn't matter how, right? So some, someone's drunk, someone's behaving badly, someone said something inappropriate, whatever the situation is. The important thing here, I think, I'm going to literally loop back to where this whole conversation started with a reminder of why are we doing this? Why are we here? This is what everyone needs to be reminded of. When things get heated, it's time for everyone to remember you're all here to play games together. You're here to share a pastime with each other and have a good time playing games. Stop whatever's going on, take a break, have everyone get up, stretch, walk around, pause, and remind people why they're here. Um, tell them, like, we're, we're here to play games. If you're not here to play games, we're all here together. We, we came together to sit down, social have fun, et cetera. Remind people of that. Give them the, the heads up that, hey, focus, this is why we're here. Now, one problem that may emerge is while games are and should be fun, part of the definition of a game is competition. Uh, and the majority of games, at least board games, we'll leave RPGs aside for the most part, involve winners and losers. Yeah. Um, but even within RPGs, you know, we've talked in other episodes about competitiveness and about that, you know, those players that need to win. And, and you know, maybe it's even uh, not, not one player all the time, but just it happens. Uh, competitiveness either is there or can emerge in both types of gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be an issue when you're, you know, it's not all about the fun because someone is trying to focus on the competitiveness above and beyond. The, the fun mm -hmm. of a gaming session. Yeah, the thing is, often just taking that moment, right? Just diffusing the situation and taking a break will be enough to, to especially the hottest heads, right? The, the, especially the anger, the quick emotions, the quick, fast, hard emotions. But then after you have the break, you need to have that shall you, 
how we continue conversation. The one we basically moved, we talked about above when talking about board games, role playing games, getting everyone on the same page, right? If people want to call it a night, call it a night. As I've said before, and we're going to say many times, not every game night is perfect. And if you're having a bad one, just like a bad game, end it. Call it, even if it's early. There's no need to to complete something you've started. Remember that lost time fallacy I mentioned. You didn't waste your time so far, and maybe the rest of your time for the night is better spent doing something else. Turn lost time into not losing more time. Maybe I shouldn't have done this as long as I did, but doing more of that thing I shouldn't have been doing isn't going to magically make the old stuff better. Yeah, there, there's no reason to push through it. It's not a competition. You're not going to win a reward for finishing a bad game night. Now, if people are still interested in gaming, uh, maybe it's time to swap up what's getting played. If people are getting upset, there's a reason, right? That people don't, it, it may be something out of game, but it's possible it's the game, or it could be a mechanic in the game. Or it could be that they're in last, the person's in last place and they know they can't win. Or they've been rolling ones all damn night long and their character is totally deprotagonized, right? These are all things that come up in games. In that case, it's probably best to end that particular game, that particular session. Now, if it's a problem with another player, not only end the game, and yes, end the game if two players have a problem with each other, but after that, split those players up. This is okay. You don't have to enjoy playing games with every other gamer on the planet. Look up the geek social fallacies. There is no bond between all us people who grew up as geeks together, except for the fact we have a standard upbringing. There's, there's no, you don't have to play with everyone. You don't have to love everyone. And you don't have to invite everyone to your table. Now, I'm not saying this as a gatekeeping to keep people out. I'm saying don't allow, play with people you don't enjoy playing with. We all have our own idiosyncrasies, and sometimes those aren't compatible with one another. Now, if there's only one game going on, obviously it has to end. But if there are other groups and multiple games and it's a game night, just move to another table and game with a different group of people. Now, sometimes diffusing the situation by reminding people what they're there for doesn't work. At that point, it's uh, it's, it's, it's the hard to say. It's the hard thing, right? Uh, you have to be a grown-up, right? Or someone has to, and ask the problem player to leave. This is never fun for anyone involved, both the person being asked to leave and the people asking. Uh, just try to handle it discreetly. Um, I'm no psychologist. I'm not good at this part. I've only had to do it twice, and it sucked both times. Um, just try to do it without disrupting everyone else. Try not to make a big scene. Try not to set her people out. Just politely ask someone to leave off to the side. Possibly bring back up with you if you think there's going to be a problem. Uh, that's about the best I can suggest. I'm not a bouncer. <laughs> I... <laughs> I look for backup when I'm doing things like this. Uh, try to make it as discreet as possible. And and remember, sometimes removing yourself from the situation might be the best solution. Self-care is vital. And if things are going poorly and the group is not working towards resolutions, you need to make sure that you aren't being impacted by it all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sorry gang, I feel like this just isn't working tonight. I really need to reset. Yeah. Might be the best solution where you can extract yourself from a toxic situation. You know, you can't, you can't solve everyone's problems at the table. Yeah, one of the, the things you'll see at many cons nowadays, and some people adopt this at their own game table, it's called the open door policy. And what that is, is you can walk out of my game at any time, no questions asked. Just get up, leave. It'd be awesome if you said, I'm not coming back or not, or I'll be back in five minutes. But if you can't handle that because something happened at the table, that is legitimate. Your needs are more important than our game. Now, one of the things you can do, and again, we get back to prep, right? Being pro proactive, doing things ahead of time, is especially if you're at, in a situation where you may have to ask someone to leave, is to have an actual set of documented rules for your game night. Um, even if this is at your own house, that's up to you. If you want to go that far, we talk about um, table policies and stuff like that before. But especially if you're running a public event, there should be rules. And part of this is the fact that everyone has to agree to these rules. And by having them, when someone does need to be disciplined, it's due to them breaking the rules. And it's not potentially seen as arbitrary. Like, I don't like Dave. I'm like, no, it's not that I don't like Dave. Look, here are the rules that Dave agreed to, and here's the rule Dave broke. These rules are here. We all have to enforce them equally. So I'm sorry, Dave, you broke rule six. We're going to have to ask you to leave. 
even Dave should understand that better, right? It's a lot easier to ask someone to leave due to violating a clear and written rule that they agreed to follow. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are really harsh on Dave in this world. So yeah, it's, apologies it's, to anyone, uh, anyone, Dave. <laughs> it, it, well, it was Dave's question. That's why Dave keeps popping into my head. And I don't mean it as it's all Dave's part. Apologize to all Dave. <laughs> All right, uh, we've been talking about this for a while. We, we've we covered quite a few different things, though I know we did not cover every particular circumstance here. Uh, there's no way. We could talk all night, and we wouldn't have covered everything possible. Um, and we tried to keep things broad, right? I tried to think of, like, oh, your game broke down. What do you do? Not specific situations. So I do have to say, if there's a situation we missed and you would like to talk us talk, like us to talk about it in the future, feel free. Uh let us know. We'll we'll deep dive any of these if you want us to get into it further. Uh, again, we're not experts. This is just based on experiences we personally experience, stuff I've seen. I've run an awful lot of gaming events over the years, starting since 2002. Um, I've run a lot of RPG sessions, too. So I, I think I'm talking from an area of expertise, but I am definitely no expert, uh, especially not a professional level expert. But we are more than willing to discuss any of this further. Well, if you do have a question like this for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, let's head over to the lobby and see what they think. I've got a comment here from uh, Word Morningstar. I like to avoid looking up the rules, but I don't feel strongly enough about it to force people to keep playing instead of looking up the rules. Yeah, it's just, I, I see that in books. Like, DM advice is always, just make a ruling and keep going. And I don't feel, I, I have no problem with um, the Misdirected Mark podcast. There's this really good thing where they describe rules of play and how you you shift during while you're playing, whether you're at the character level, the player level, the story level, and there's these different levels. I don't have a problem backing out. I've never have. Um, to me, RPGs are, are abstractions all the time. I'd, I've never felt the, the need for you to feel immersed 100% of the time. It's the same reason... I personally think the the rules where you're not allowed to talk out a character is a BS is the term I'll use here without without going less PG. I personally want to I have a I have a strong theory that the designers put rules in games for a reason. And I think in general most RPGs are probably best enjoyed when running them as the person who designed them in, in, intended. And the rules are there for a reason. They usually work together as long as you give them a chance. Like I was one of those few people that in AD and D used weapon speeds, used somatic components, and tracked encumbrance. I used all those rules and enjoyed using them, and so did my players at the time. Like to to us, that was all part of the game. The fact that a, a piercing weapon did less damage to a skeleton just made sense to us, right? I so we've always tried to do that, and I find if you're at the point where you're breaking too many rules, for me, I just rather go find another game. Because there are other games out there, especially if you're looking for F20 fantasy games. I'm sure someone's done an OSR variant that has AD&D without those rules and some other thing. Well, I don't know, shaping fireballs or something that you think is really cool. Um, so I always try to play raw, like almost always. I think I almost never house rule any of my games. I, I guess I must, part of me must be lawfully aligned to use the D&D setting rules for alignments it's just something i'm about the same reason when i read a rule book i start on page one and finish on page 399 and don't flip around but yeah. that, that's me i know other people feel a different way i personally would always rather stop and look up the rule and yet at the same point you know i said earlier that we aren't rules lawyers and and that comes from the sort of ultimate literal interpretation that happens from some players yeah. you get those players who you know have memorized the books backwards and forwards and can tell you that on Spell Compendium 3, page 47, line 2, it says that you can alternately do, like, come on. I mean, yeah, if at the if same we are point. rules lawyers, we're not rule abusers. <laughs> yeah. It's people who use the rules to their advantage. That's not our goal. Yeah. I try to enforce the rules as written. Now, I say, I know that's not for everyone. I, I also enjoy indie games with almost no rules, too, so I can do both. But then I want that in my indie game. I don't want that in my D&D 3.5. Yep. Uh, and uh, Jeff mentions, you know, a dead character is an emotional time in many games. But then yeah. 30 minutes later, you've got a new character and you're ready to go. If you weren't upset, then you didn't like that character enough. True. Very true. I have character deaths enough to, to stop a session. We've had yeah. nights that we stopped. It, it was dramatic enough that the, the, it was worth stopping to continue on. 
Um, I have had TPKs kill games, but the the one time I ran Pathfinder, that that game never finished because of a TPK. So it's it definitely happens. What we missed was the big discussion at the end. We well, had a bunch of upset people. People went home, and then we never got together again. We should have right then said, what do you want to do, and talked about it. Well, one of the big problems, uh, and uh, in the uh, chat room, uh, Zanister, no, not Zan uh, yes, Zanister was talking about how, uh, you know, he got one-shotted and uh, after a miss and never played D&D &D again. And that's one yep. of the things that, that can really be affected, I think, is... Um, depending on where in a game you are, you know, if it's your first session or if it's your 10th session of a game, you might never want to go back to that game because of a player kill or even worse, a TPK. Uh, when in reality, you know, these things do happen and it was bad timing. You didn't get to experience the fullness of the game before that player get death soured you on the system. Um, and that may not always be the case, but it's one of those things where... Yeah. It's really easy for that death to sour to sour things, especially if you had liked the character you rolled up. Yeah. Uh, well, that was my personal experience with D and D. I hated D and D the first time I played it and didn't play it for like ten years. Finally gave it a shot once Second Edition Skills and Powers came out, because my first experience experience with Brad running it killed my character in one shot after spending three hours making characters, which should never take three hours to make D and D characters. <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time because. I don't even know. We were using every book. I had a plus three shield at level one because if you worship this god from this book, you started with this, and I, it was bad. Yep. There's uh, and and Anchi Games is mentioning. It was interesting that you talked about how a TPK can be upsetting to the DM too. Uh, it can. And now at the same point, uh, Jeff mentions uh, that. Uh, uh, where is it? Uh, or sorry, there's a. Uh, and she games mentions there is a certain DM mindset that sees TPK as a goal. Yeah. I think there's a lot more DMs and DMs out there who are part of the story, right? They're they're yeah. they are part of this shared environment, whether it's a modern RPG or you know something more old school. Um, you know, they're helping everyone else through this story, or they're telling their own story through the players. Uh, and if you've killed off all of the characters in your book, you've got nowhere to go. Um, there's there's no more story. So it you know, all of a sudden your novel is over before you wanted it to be. Uh, that can be tough. Uh, there is something to be said. I know Chris Nizak and I have argued about this one in person and on the show a couple times. For the confrontational GM, the the um, adversarial GM, but in the effect of running the game more like a board game, running it as a tournament, running it as a challenge. I do run D and D games like that, and what I am doing then is I am following the raw as close as possible and running a published module only, never my own. It wouldn't work with my own. I can't be arbitrary on my own world. It doesn't work. But if I am using someone else's printed work. And the goal for the players, and we know people who still enjoy this style of play, Deanna being one of them, is they beat that module. And I made it as hard as possible for them to do so while sticking to the limits of the module. And I personally think that is a very valid way to play and can be very enjoyable. The fact Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition plummeted kind of shows that most people don't feel that way. But I don't think the adversarial GM is wrong or bad. What's wrong or bad is the adversarial GM that can, that, that's running their own world. Because there's no challenge in killing characters in a role-playing game. You are the GM. You you can fudge the dice. You can up the dice. You can have a Beholder show up. You can have a Terra step on them. You can do the rocks fall. You all die. You literally have that power. So why is there any challenge or joy in killing characters off? It just, that is the, the adversarial GM I hate. Absolutely. But running a moduli as difficult to the best of my tactical ability and seeing if the characters can get past that obstacle to me is a very valid way to play. And Absolutely. one a, a style of play I actually enjoy. I, I think to me, I mean, realistically, uh, if you've got a module and you're playing it for your players, you are essentially a more creative and personal version of a computer RPG. Mm. Um, and and yeah. we like computer RPGs. People People deliberately go out and play computer RPGs. And what that is, is an adversarial GM. Yeah, so it is. 
very much. To, to say to say that uh, that you don't like an adversarial GM means you don't play your computer RPGs because that's yeah. what it is. I said it's a different style of play. It's it's, yeah. it's competitive. It, it's more of a game yeah. than a look at the gameist narrative as simulationist. It's simulationist and gameist. It's yeah. you can win, and and to me though, what the players get out of that is the bragging rights of playing. This is why Adventure League is popular because. All three of us can go play the same adventure under three different DMs and then get together and compare notes and be like, oh, we killed the troll. I'm like, oh, the troll beat us down and like have that shared experience, which is is part something that, that nowadays is only an adventure sleep. It used to be a bigger part of D&D, especially in the old days, right? There was I, I Survived the Tomb of Horrors being the one that, yeah, right, you did. But like all of them, right? I went through Lost Caverns of Soul Strands. But I have no idea how to pronounce that word. Uh, or I went through the Temple of Elemental Evil and I did this and comparing your notes, the shared experience of playing through the same module run as as written with the same approximate difficulty, right? Like every DM is going to have their own little tricks, but assuming it's written raw, what you survived is what someone else survived. You get that shared experience. And I've always enjoyed that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the few... Uh... The ones I've actually done is Dragon Mountain way back on, you yeah. know, too. And, and it was fantastic. And it was nice that I could go and talk to other players about right, exactly. my experiences in Dragon Mountain. Um, yeah. Because I, as much as I've always enjoyed all of our plays, you didn't, you generally ran your own worlds for the for most D &D, part. Yeah. Uh, for D&D. &D and, and, well, we didn't know anyone we, we could compare with on Warhammer. When, yeah, when you at ran, that uh, time, we didn't know anyone else who did yeah. the enemy with it. But yeah. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, so no, it was, it was a change to be able to talk about, uh, you know, my experiences in Dragon Mountain versus your experiences in Dragon Mountain. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's something in my, in, in my opinion, is almost lost nowadays. Like, there is the Adventures Leap, but there's so many modules. It's a little harder. But that is the one thing I, that I find missing from modern story gaming, right? Like, you played Hydro Hackers, I played Hydro Hackers, someone else played Hydro Hackers, or another Powered by the Apocalypse game. Despite it both being about feeling that block of ice, you would have had a completely different game than I had. Yeah. Like, like our shared experience was the module started off the same, because that's how PBTA goes, right? The the premise was the same. Although there is, there is there, something to be said about that as well, and, and, and to be able to enjoy the differences yes. rather than the sameness. Yeah, that's true. I have had that comment. Like, oh, what happened in your? Yeah. I oh, who did you play? Name. Who did you play in that? Uh, in that? In yeah, or that from the loop, right? Yeah. Um, you, you get you get a lot of that whole. You know, oh, who did you play yeah. when I, when you played that scenario? What? Oh, wow. Yeah, I got you know completely yeah, flattened by a robot. Way. Oh no, yeah. we went and hid inside the closet or something. And again, nothing against either style of play. Both yeah. perfectly valid, and trust me, I do both. I, I I don't know if that's the equivalent of saying as I have a friend, but. <laughs> I hope not, but I, I play both story games. I have done full improv games. I played the um, the Jim Pinto system there, Protocol. Now I've I've that's about that's as immersive I got. I have a LARP. I can't talk about LARP. Alrighty. A note to our guest. Um, though it's not in here. Uh, we I stick around after the show as usual. Those of you here in the lobby, we got some cool stuff. At the end of the show, I have a big old box of games from Ravensburger to open, uh, though not for a really happy reason. But I'll get into that in the after show. I don't think we'll we'll bring it up here on the main show. All right, we'll be checking back into the lobby a few more times during the show. We like to keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, click on the bell, and thumbs up, thumbs up, retweet, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow. All that we can. Keep adding more things and trying new things. So now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna stagnate. Every everything keeps changing. We keep changing things. We we constantly change. This is because we don't get enough feedback. We need more feedback. Someone tell us what we're doing is good, and then maybe we'll stop. Otherwise, we keep trying new stuff. Sign up to receive tabletop bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, hopefully on Wednesdays, if everything's going good. It went out today. I will send out an email. Recapping all the content we released in the weeks previous. Blog posts, podcast episodes, videos, reviews, anything else we create, you'll get a link to it right there in your inbox. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right. We're going to take a minute to yet again mention our newly revised Patreon campaign. We're going to be doing this for a while because we're excited about it. We're really happy with where it's going. And people seem to be happy with what they see, too, as well. 
So we are going to highlight a backer tier again and explain why we think you might be excited about that level. This week, we're looking at the I'm just here for the deals level. All right. And in addition to being the tabletop bellhop, answering your gaming and game night questions, I spend a lot of my time searching the web for the best prices on tabletop games. Uh, this includes board games, RPGs, miniatures, card games, and more. Well, when Mo finds these deals, he shares them on social media, places like the Good De Geek Deals Facebook page and at Tabletop underscore Deals Twitter account. The I'm just here for the deals backer level is for people who appreciate what I do with the deal sharing and follow me primarily for that service and not the other stuff we do here at the Bellhop. The I'm just here for, oh, sorry, we get it. Sometimes saving money is all you're looking for and that's okay. Yep, perfectly legit. That's why you're just here for the deals. Patrons at this level get their names put on an exclusive patron-only mailing list. Whenever there's a super hot deal, like not every deal, there's no way it's every deal. There's too many I find during the day. There's too many, too many sales to share everyone, and I'd just be spamming your inbox. This is only for the best of the best. The stealth sales, the online price that shouldn't be missed, the map breaker that's 75% off or anything like that. I'm going to mail out a Tabletop Gaming Deals Hot Deals newsletter that goes out exclusively to that mailing list. Now, the kicker here is I'm going to send that newsletter before I share the deal anywhere else, giving you the initiative and improving your odds of getting a hot deal before it sells out. All right, February 19th. That's our next live show. That's our next stream. Well, actually, yeah, technically we're streaming on Thursday, but it's our next actual play. No, no, our next live podcast. I'm yeah. getting all mixed up here. <laughs> our next podcast, our next live show is in this show that we're recording right now. Uh, tomorrow, for those of you listening at home, Wednesday, February 19th, we are going to be reviewing the hot new party game, Medium. On the same day, we are going to launch our next giveaway for two copies of that game. The contest will run for three weeks, and we'll be announcing the winner on our live show, March 11th. This contest will be open to anyone in North America. All right, in addition, I got a reward for the locals. There's a few of you in the chat tonight. I am planning on doing a demo night for Medium January 22nd at the CG Realm. That's a Saturday. I've got another copy of the game to give away that night, and the only requirement to enter is that you show up and actually try the game at least once. That's right. We're giving away three copies of Medium. Thank you, Greater Than Games, for the opportunity to do this for our fans. And finally, one more bit of seamless self-promotion back to our Patreon Anyone at the hotel guest level or higher will get five bonus entries into this contest. Yeah. The next thing we've got coming up is our first con of the year. Yes, it is official. All three of us, Mo, Sean, and Deanna, will be going to Breakout Con in downtown Toronto, Ontario. Now that's taking part on the, uh, you know, I guess it's the end of the spring break or the weekend just previous to St. Patty's Day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what's the actual dates? I don't have it in front of me. Uh, they are, let me just... If you want to grab the actual dates. Over there. So yeah, we will be at BreakoCon. Deanna and I are heading up on Thursday. Um, there's, we will be at the um, pre-show, or I don't know, pre-show Yeah, the pre-event is on the 19th, the with pre the con being the 20th to the 22nd. Yeah, so March. we will be at we will be at the pre event on the nineteenth, uh, being held at Stormcrow Manor. Sounds really cool. Deanna's been there before. It's a geek themed bar with geek themed drinks. You can get a Romulan ale. You can get a butter beer. They have sliders and stuff like that. And this is uh, we're paying to be here. This isn't like we're going as special guests or anything cool like that. But we are. I, I wanted to be able to meet up with some of the people. All the special guests are supposed to be there. We're gonna you know rub shoulders with the famous people and have some drinks and relax the night before the con starts. Uh, we are going to be there all weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Deanna will be taking one day off to uh, hit the Comic-Con because Toronto Comic-Con is going on at the same time. And I do recommend people check that out as well, especially if you're into pop culture. Uh, Deanna strongly recommends you go to the drawing panels. I forget exactly what you call them, but you get to watch artists draw and then they auction off the art, the, um, they auction off the, uh, blah, blah, the artwork at the end of it. Um, we don't have a set plan. There's some gaming events we signed up for. Uh, we are going as media, so I will point that out. We are going to be doing coverage. We'll be tweeting. We'll be sharing on Instagram. And we will, of course, have a Breakout Con recap episode once we get back, uh, whatever weekend that works out. We might actually do that to replace our AMA if the timing's right, just because 
not a lot of people love the con recaps, but we do want to give Breakout a shout out. Previous experiences with Breakout have been amazing. Um, some of the best con experiences I've ever had. Uh, assuming it ha nothing's changed, and I don't see why it would, Breakout Con is the most inclusive and inviting gaming convention I have ever seen, with the most tools in place to keep it that way going forward. Uh, so thanks, Breakout Con, for inviting us yet again. Looking forward to hitting that up later in the month. Up next, a review of the Legacy of Lopan expansion for Big Trouble in Little China. All right, first, I do need to note that I was given a review copy of this expansion from everything Epic Games at Origins this year. Uh, no other compensation was provided. Legacy of Lopan was designed by Christopher Batarlis and Boris Polonsky. Features art from Henning Ludvigsen and was published by Everything Epic Games in 2019. Now, it's important to note that all of the content in this expansion was originally included in the deluxe version of the Big Trouble in Little China board game. Now, that was published in 2018 after a very successful Kickstarter. Well, the best way to see what you get with this expansion is to watch our unboxing video on YouTube that went live just today. How about you tell us what you get for those who haven't checked it out yet? All right, well... When first opening the box, the first thing I noticed and was very surprised by was the fact there's no miniatures in here. Because the the main game is kind of basically a miniature game. It's pretty much a miniature-focused game. And I was honestly shocked to not find any miniatures in this expansion. Yeah, this was at the time really shocking. And even now, knowing that I it had been a part of the original Kickstarter release, somewhat disappointing. Where yeah. is the bearded Lopan? Should have been in there. Uh, plus other reasons. We'll, we'll get to the miniatures later. Now, what I did find is a ridiculously thin board overlay uh, folded in half. This this thing's poor, like, for, for component quality. Uh, it's, it's really not impressed by this piece for something that's meant to cover part of the main board while playing. Um, there are 10 more red character dice. Uh, these are the exact same as the ones from the base game and are meant to be used when playing with five or six players. There's also two grill tokens that are the front of the Pork Chop Express. Uh, two red pegs, two blue pegs, all of this there for the same reason, to play with more players. Uh, there's also a small red clip uh, in there with a baggie. Uh, red clip that, again, not the best component. Now there's the punch board that has some of these tokens on it. also has a bunch of new tokens to be used with a new scenario book. And one larger low pan, sorcerer low pan boss board. Again, all these match the quality of the original game. So the still, still the same solid quality, thick punches you got in the first game. No, no complaint on the token quality at all. Yeah, no, the components are fine. Uh, the, except that overlay is yeah, a little the bit. The token components are. The, to the, the, the overlays. player boards are great. It's just yeah. that one overlay. The one overlay is a little little chintzy. Uh, there are two packs of cards, some Hobbit size, some regular size. The regular size are all kinds of new random quest cards, as well as a little setup reference card. The Hobbit size ones are new rewards and a new set of Chinese hells. Finally, we have the campaign book. Now, this is the same physical size as in, you know, I don't know what you call it. It's not A4, whatever it is, digest size. Book is the main campaign book and almost as thick, which is impressive. Uh, this does contain the new rules, which are really short at the beginning, and a new branching campaign scenario that you can play instead of playing the base game. So it's worth noting that while these cards can be mixed in with the original content, uh, or most of them anyway, you might not want to, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So what does this expansion add to the big trouble in Little China board game? All right, the most basic thing it does, the first thing it does is ups the game to six players. Now, the original game did come with six characters, but you can only play four of the six characters in any one game. Note, this expansion doesn't have any new characters. It just has the bits, the dice, the punches, the, the little, I don't know what you call them, pegs, that let you play with all six of the original characters at once. Now, this is actually really nice, uh, and kind of a shame it wasn't in the original game. Because it, while it undoubtedly changes the difficulty of the game, it's a very casual and co-op game, so more people at the table is not a bad thing for the enjoyment level of this game. Uh, the other thing you get is uh, new cards to add to the base game. So there's 11 new side missions and a handful of new hell cards. Now these, literally, you can just take and put with your base game. Now the hell cards are worth noting, though, because they're called, they, they, they called them social hell cards. And what they involve is the players at the table doing something outside the game 
or else they get an in-game penalty, or they have something outside the game that gives them a bonus. Things like, you must talk in an accent all the time, or if you happen to have green eyes, you get a bonus in-game. Now, personally, out of the social cards I've seen so far, and I haven't read them all, I would leave them out of the game, or at least curate them very carefully. I was not overly impressed with them, but then I'm also not that kind of social gamer, so your mileage may vary. Now, these additions to me are interesting enough, like they add to a six player, fair enough, they're cool. But the real thing, the meat of this expansion, the thing that most people really want to, would care about, I think, here is this new scenario. Now, this scenario is in the form of a campaign, like a full campaign style of play. Uh, this has the players traveling through time to rewrite history by defeating Lopan in the past. It's meant to be played by the same players each game, where your characters are going to advance and should take two or more sessions to complete. Now, while they do say two or more sessions, you could totally do this in a single setting if you had enough snacks, <laughs> drinks, and a solid block of time. I don't know that I'd recommend it, but it's totally doable, and we've even discussed potentially doing it at Extra Life next year. Uh, one thing to note is there is no mechanism for uh, saving game information, mm -hmm. so get your cameras out if you are going to go uh, jump between, uh, you know, sessions. Yeah, that was something I actually missed that on the, the written review that I published earlier today. The game expects you to put it away and take it back out, but gives you no way to do that. That is a, a little frustrating. Uh, what's interesting about this new scenario, and I actually found rather fascinating, is how it literally replaces the game you already own. It, it's almost like buying a second game. It uses the same board and minis and components, but has a totally new way to play the game, featuring a much more story-driven style of gameplay, which the story has some branching, branching elements as well. And it's weird because like you leave, it almost felt like half of the components of the base game in the box and don't even use them. It's yeah. also worth noting that they give you two different difficulties you can play at, which is kind of cool including what they call the story mode, which to me really makes me think of video game story mode. And that's pretty much what this is, is you are going to play on super easy so you get to see the whole story, which is an interesting addition. Yeah, we were pretty frustrated during the setup at how few components you actually got to use in the new scenario. We just felt like we kept putting everything back into mm -hmm. the box more so than we were taking out of the expansion box. Yeah, you definitely, you put away more than you get in this new set. So it ends up that wasn't a bad thing. I don't think in any way. Like I wasn't missing the stuff, but man, when setting up, it's like, are we even playing the same game? And well, the answer is no, you're not. Um, so overall thoughts on this. Um, we're not going to break down how to play all this. It's basically the same as the original game with a new story. You're still doing this using the same mechanics. But I do want to start off with the fact that myself and the other five people who have played this game with me shared the experience with us and actually had a lot of fun playing through this new campaign scenario. We were laughing. We enjoyed the story. We honestly had fun, but this was despite many problems that came up during our play of legacy of Lopan. Yeah. Now one major caveat I think is that we all love the movie. We all watch it. We all still watch it. Yeah. And it has a basically a sentimental value. Uh, if you don't know and love the movie, well, I don't know why you would have bought this game in the first place. Yeah, very true. Uh, like, you might be playing it because your friend loves the movie, but no, I don't think anyone's buying this game. Uh, it didn't win any Ennies or uh, Origins Awards for Best New System, so I'm pretty sure you're already a fan at this point. Um, so, unfortunately, getting to the bad. My first disappointment, which I already mentioned above, was seeing what was in the box. This is not a cheap board game expansion. We're looking at $39.99 US. At this price point, you're, you're at, like, I could buy a full game for that cost, not an expansion. I can go out and get a game with miniatures and a full game, right? I expected to more from this box. First of all, the minis, right? Like, I, like even when I first opened it, I was disappointed there were no minis, but like when you play, there should have been minis because you substitute miniatures for things. Like there's a scene where you're fighting lightning and lightning uses lightning to resurrect some Nazis, which is pretty cool. But then you put out spirit path warriors, which look like terracotta warriors with swords. Like, come on, you're using Wing Kong hatchet men as Old West outlaws. Like, at least give us, like Sean said, the, the Sorcerer Lopan model, right? The big bearded, low, like, give me a main boss fight, at least. Yeah, the sticker price for me is kind of the deal breaker on this. 
this is maybe twenty dollars of content in a forty dollar box. Now, admittedly, there is a lot of story here, and writers need to get paid. But we'll get to that <laughs> as yeah. we move on. Uh, this comes to the second problem. Um, every single one of uh, not the second problem, but the rest of the problems really. Every single one of these could have been avoided had they just hired a, a developer and an editor, possibly the same person, possibly different people. The amount of grammatical and spelling errors in this book was honestly embarrassing. Like that, it felt like a first draft. There were sentences so bad they did not make sense. And we shared around the table, do you know what that meant? And we couldn't figure it out. Now, Sean was playing narrator. So I'll let him expound on the, the problems of the book. So we decided, for better or worse, as you can see in our AP videos, that I'd be the voice of the game. Don't worry, I did not do any racial or character accents related to the game. Some Australians may have been inadvertently insulted during this playthrough, however. <laughs> but the game was, at many points, just giant blocks of text for me to yes. read with no gameplay. But that text often required me to edit and substitute words and thoughts in real time when I wasn't just deciding to read verbatim and highlight the glaring grammatical errors that were being presented to me. So then there was the fact that, well, there were huge swaths of text might have been workable into an interesting script for a prequel. It didn't actually match what was happening on the board in front of us. Yeah, because the grammatical stuff didn't affect the gameplay, right? Yeah. But for a campaign all about the story, it definitely takes you out of it, right? Like, you're here to hear the story, and you can't even read the story because of the problems. But like Sean just alluded to, this is nothing compared to the disconnect between that story and what was actually happening on the table. You emerge from the smoke in the basement of the restaurant. Move all of your characters to the street. Yeah, exactly. Like, while playing, there will be times when the story indicates that all the characters are in a room together, yet your miniatures are all over the board. Or one of the first times it really stuck out is we had a scene outside, and despite the fact it said everyone's outside and someone was still back inside the building, it talks about how these police officers come around the corners and surround us. And then it has us spawn miniatures, some right in the square we're on, and another down the street out of line of sight. What? Or a bomb goes off, hitting everyone who doesn't defend, even if only one person's in the spot with the thing and the other person's the other side of Chinatown. You'll be told to slide a progress marker on a track that doesn't exist anywhere. There is no track to slide the progress marker on. Sometimes, just sometimes, the narrative will actually say your characters are in a spot and the game will actually have you move your minis there. But this is literally the rare exception. Like, I think it only happened three times during the entire campaign over like seven chapters. I personally found this extremely maddening and frustrating. If you watch the actual play, you can hear it in my voice. I was getting really annoyed by this. Uh, doubly so because it would have been so easy to fix. Like, did no one play test this expansion at all before it was published? Like, this was so blatantly obvious right from the first part of the game. Like, how did no one notice this and be like, hey, everything epic. I, uh, what do I do? It says we're all here, but we're not. And, and do we not? What? Like, how? How did that not get? How did that get past development? How did that get past play testing? Now, along with this, Toss in all your usual editing problems and ambiguous and missing contradictory rules. Like, I would go so far as to say this game is a mess. Like, this book is a mess. It, it's almost unplayable. Yeah, I don't think we're understating things here to say that a substantial rewrite is needed. Not for content as much as clarity, grammar, and connection to what's happening on the board. Now, all this said, all right, if you can overlook these flaws and your group is willing to house roll things or go with the flow or just go with the narrative and say, well, it's that we're all in the basement. Let's put us all in the basement. There's quite a bit of fun to be had with this expansion. Like the mechanics work. There, there's nothing wrong with them. Actually, I'm impressed by the dice pool system in Big Trouble in Little China. I said that when I, when I talked about the original game, it's actually a really unique system that works. Um, this campaign is really cool because you actually get to level your character up, which is something when we played the base game happened a bit, but like we all had our characters to a level six by the end of the campaign and got to make some cool, meaningful decisions. Yeah, we did run the story on 
easy yes. or story mode. Now, this is specifically just like in a video game there to make sure that you get to experience the game without fr the frustration of too many hells piling up on your character. We chose this option because we did want to experience it all. But honestly, again, on the other side, we found this almost too easy. When we did get to the end, we still had a huge stack of the tokens that are used to get yourself out of trouble. Um, they're sort of, you know, your fate points or whatever you want to consider them in other games. Uh, and we were pretty much all maxed out. Uh, we had one character who had, you know, hit the max and rolled over three mm -hmm. times. Um, and that being said, we also accidentally, through our story choices, skipped two chapters of the, yep. this expansion. So for whatever reason, they may have overdone it a little bit on how easy the story mode actually was. But yeah, it, remembering that first game and how we played the first time, it's quite possible that if we hadn't been on easy mode, we might have been utterly slaughtered because the game is difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. In the normal mode, it is not easy and it's not supposed to be easy. No, I get I I think if we didn't get the extra time tokens, we probably would have lost. It, it seemed like it. I don't know. But it, yeah, it was too easy. Now, as for the other bits, uh, besides the new campaign, I don't, I don't have any complaints, right? Being able to play with six players is cool. New side mission cards are fine. I personally didn't mind the new Hells, but our group was definitely split over it. Uh, most people did not like having to do silly things outside of the game, though Cat was really entertained by it. So those are take it or leave it. Uh, overall, though, like that, that, that part being great, that's definitely not worth the price of entry just to be able to play a couple more characters, right? I Sorry to say, I can't recommend this i can't recommend legacy of lopan for big trouble in little china like we did have fun we had fun playing through the campaign but that fun fun was threatened repeatedly with problems and inconsistencies in the book the game text this made the entire experience feel unfinished and unpolished and like it just it felt like i was playing an ash can right for the role-playing term it just felt like a play test i i think the only thing that actually saved this game for us is the players who we were playing with I, I think we would have had fun playing anything together. We could have brought out the Masters of the Universe role-playing game and had a good time, right? I think I would have hated playing this with a group of strangers at a local game night. It just happened that our group was going to have fun doing anything. Now, maybe if you are a huge fan of the original game, like I'm saying huge fan, like, oh, I played all the time and I played through the scenario multiple times and I've tried all the characters, right? You really dig the original game and your group is comfortable making house rules and ignoring the inconsistencies and just rolling with it, then check it out. Sure, maybe you'll enjoy it. But even then, look for a sale. Like, I, I agree with Sean here. I don't think this is $40 worth of content, even for fans. Now, for those of you who did get the deluxe box set, right? You bought the Kickstarter version, and this came in your box. I'm not saying throw this stuff out. Like, if you've got it already, do check it out. Play around with it. Just be ready to deal with the inevitable inconsistencies and omissions from that book. For a more in-depth look at Big Trouble in Little China, Legacy of Lo Pan, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on review. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our table? Every week we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. Now, we've got a lot to cover this week. Not only was Sean down, but there was a CG Realm game night. CG? I don't know. It came out weird. CG Realm game night. And we had a full host for my, my Monday night group. So we had a lot going on. Indeed. We started off with finishing our big game of Little Trouble with the Legacy of Lopan expansion when I got into town last Friday. We'd started this a few weeks back, so I wanted to get back down as soon as my schedule allowed so we could wrap it up and get our <laughs> final feelings on the game, good or bad. Even if it meant another night without Gloomhaven for those poor fans. Yeah, fair to the secret for Sean. We just got to play parts of campaigns and we'll get him back in. So we did live stream this game, so you can check it out on our Twitch channel uh, tomorrow, I think. We'll go live on, on YouTube. Uh, you'll get to see the second half of Big Trouble in Little China, where Sean Hamilton joined Sean from Hamilton in Windsor, um, which was kind of cool. We did finish off the campaign, uh, defeated Lopan in his ancient headquarters. Uh, despite many problems with the expansion we've already discussed in our review segment, I think we all had fun playing the game. Indeed, the game is, as a co-op, pretty social, so even with the flaws, we enjoyed hanging out with each other and playing a game together. 
Uh, after we finished Lopam, which was fairly quick, we weren't sure how long the last chapter was going to be. It is longer than the other chapters, but we probably should have broke our first session a little earlier. Uh, I broke out my copy of Gorus Maximus. This is a card game from Inside Up Games. I was really looking forward to trying this with more than three players, and I'm glad I did. Three players, it was okay, but we played a six-player game, which is still not the max player count. The max player count's eight. Um, I think everyone but Deanna really enjoyed it. She wasn't a huge fan. Uh, game was okay with three, but with six, it shined. Like, it, you could see all the things. Like, it just all worked. Uh, Tori and Kat seemed to be particularly smitten by the game, uh, being card game and Euchre fans. Uh, you played it for the first time. What do you think of it? Yeah, no, it's a fun game. Though I think all of us, uh, even though I don't really drink, would have preferred some adult beverages yeah. with it. It was just that kind of game uh, suited to that sort of experience. Now, while the cards are cartoony, they are very gory, as we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. I found I barely even noticed it while playing, as the images on the card have zero impact on the game, almost in a disappointing way. Uh, they've gone to all this great art, and you don't ever look at them, really. <laughs> yeah, to, to be honest, yeah. I Someone pointed it out playing, and I, I'm the same way, right? You, hold, you fan your cards, and you look at, you know, they've got the... Uh, what do you call it? I icon iconography is all in the corner. Yeah. Right. Though we did point out you can't hold your cards upside down. Which it is, it is annoying that they didn't put the put it on both ends like a, yeah. a, a playing card. They really should have. So besides that, I'll admit, yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of the art, but like Sean said, you actually really don't notice it while you're playing. Though Cat did notice it and loved it. So I, it's the same thing we said before. Not all games are for everyone. I'm personally not a fan of the art on this game, but I do dig the gameplay. So after Goris Maximus, Tori, and Kat headed home, Sean, Dan, and I were full of Cape Cup coffee and wide awake, so we decided to play one more game. Now, Sean had heard us raving about Orleone lately and wanted to try that, so we broke that out with Trade and Intrigue, which uh, we'll get a review for that one soon. I'm now, I think I'm at that point. I still have to try Intrigue. We haven't tried Intrigue. Uh, this time we used the Beneficial Deeds board, which I'm always going to use. We used the new events, but we left the routes uh, in the box. The, the route, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the trading routes. The cards in the box, and we, of course, didn't use the intrigue rules. Uh, man, that was my personal best game of Orleans. Like, I've been playing it quite a bit lately. I played it quite a bit before. Um, I think I'm up to 10 plays so far. But, man, I tried some new stuff, and, man, they paid off in that game. Which isn't just that they're dominant strategies, just with the way everyone else was playing. Um, it was nice to be able to show Sean that Deanna doesn't always win every Euro we play. What do you think of Orleans? Well, you know, this one was a struggle, I have to admit. Uh, part of it, I'm sure, was the late night, but I'm also just not... <laughs> A super heavy gamer. Uh, I enjoy some of them, but I don't always pick them up as fast as I could because I don't play so many of them, I think. Mm -hmm. So I haven't gotten a lot of those ways of thinking about the heavy games like that, uh, you know, sort of set ready at hand. Now, that mm -hmm. being said, this is one I think could grow to be a favorite. And while Mo might call it heresy, I think <laughs> if you offered me a choice between Orleans and Wallenstein, I'd pick Orleans. Uh, we can't all be right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Saturday afternoon, after some amazing ramen, great job, Solon. I'm um, glad to see Euros Asian Eatery swapped over to a ramen house full-time, which is pretty great. So if anyone wants to come to Windsor now, you don't have to wait till Saturday to get it. Uh, I broke out the 18 box from Yellow. Uh, this one, the pile of obligations, like it's the heaviest weight on that pile. We'll put it that way. I did pick this one up at Origins. I need to get this to the table more. I did bring it out when I first got it home to easy mode, but I we need to get some more plays in. So we played a quick three-player game of Outspeed, one of the three games that comes with the 8-bit box. Uh, Deanna didn't do so well in this one, got eliminated early, which made for a really odd two-player experience because the game is designed for a minimum of three players. Excuse me. With her getting eliminated, that did some weird things. But it wasn't terrible. Um, I think it went well enough. What were your thoughts on Outspeed and, well, the 8-bit box? Well, I think the concept of the game, and, that's, and by that I mean the whole 8-bit box, is really... Uh, there's some fantastic design work involved in packaging and components, but it really is a group party game. Uh, and it really str seems to struggle with that lower player count. It's definitely got potential, but even though the game absolutely evoked memories of those scrolling racers from back in my Commodore 64 mm -hmm. days, it was just lacking the people and the party-like environment to take it to that, this is a great game level. Yeah. Yeah, I found it. Outspeed's interesting. Interestingly, it's basically a social deduction game, right? Trying to predict where other players are going to go, and it's one I like, so must be doing something right. 
Now, as everyone listening knows, I got some copies of Medium from Greater Than Games that came in. Uh, that's going to be our next giveaway, which we've mentioned before. Uh, Saturday afternoon, I wanted to try the game out. I wanted to get some first thoughts. So we played, Deanna, Sean, and I for the first time, and I can see why there's so much hype for this game. Like, I read the rules, and I kind of read how to play, and I, in my head, it made sense. But man, reading the first cards that came out, it just clicked. Like, you're like, oh... When Deanna put down her first card that said Pete Halloween, and I looked at my hand with cards of Canoe, Slick, and Pizza, I could see the brilliance in, in, in the way this game works. Um, despite none of us, like really the three of us aren't really party game fans, we were laughing so hard that my mom had to later go, what were you guys doing down there? So uh, I really do think Medium is going to be a hit. Yeah, the ridiculousness of what you're being asked to do, combined with certain people's uh, thought processes and the way different people interact differently and life experiences dictate certain things makes this game a really great experience. Yeah. So after median, we had uh, about an hour to kill. Deanna was off getting some work done and warming up because it was a little cold in our basement that day. I grabbed a war chest off the shelf and Sean and I played a quick game of that. Um, I'm still digging this. I, I like war chest as a fantastic abstract strategy game. But man, there are some problems with the, the, the components in the board. Like, I, I'm at the point I need to take the time some afternoon and bling out my copy some way to make the board and the, 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 the chips, the control chips, a little more clear. Yeah, indeed. We've spoken about this before. The only thing I think that's stopping this game from just soaring and becoming, you know, one of those gotta-get-it-to-the-table games is some minor design, design flaws uh, that hamper the ease of play. Now, this is something they have fixed. I have the original printing of the game. Now the control tokens are hexes. They've done some work. AEG has listened to fans, but I was an early adopter, and I'm stuck with the crappy edition. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should write them, and they'll replace it. I don't know. It's, it wouldn't be hard. It's just a matter of taking the time, right? Yeah. Like taking the time to, to do some work to make the board a bit more clear. All right, next, we moved on to the CG Realm local game store in Tecumseh and Hall here in Windsor, Ontario. Uh, at this event, I had agreed to do demos of Imhotep, A New Dynasty, and that's one of the many games I played. I taught the game three times total. Everyone who played it seemed to really enjoy it. The um, more I play this Imhotep, the more I like it. And the more I play with the more new boards, the more I like them. A, and this event, I even stuck to just using them for the first two games. What was cool to see is while they are more complex, they're not too complex and were easily picked up by gamers who'd never even seen Imhotep before. Yeah, this was only my second time playing and my first time with any of the expansion components. I feel like I could teach this game to a first timer right now. Uh, yeah. It's that friendly and comfortable a game that it just makes sense the way it all works together. You, no matter which parts you're using and the concepts are all similar enough and any little details are spelled out right there on the game board. And by saying it's easy and friendly, it's not a simple game nope. either. <laughs> it's simple to learn. Yeah. Like it, it's got, it's one of those rare games, simple to teach, hard to master, right? No, but it's very much true. I, I hate reusing that, that sad trope in a way, but it really is true with this game. Now, taking a break from Imhotep, uh, Sean and I grabbed Ian, one of the employees of the CG Realm, and I taught them both how to play Horizon. Uh, I stuck to the base game, no extermination, because Sean and Ian both hadn't played it before. Um, and I, I just, Ian likes a certain style of game and I thought this would be up his alley. He likes abstract games and that, but it's the, the low to midweight, the lower midweight games seem to, seems to be the sweet spot for him. So I thought he would really dig it. Now it was also Sean's first time playing. You seem like you enjoyed this one quite a bit too. Absolutely. And we talked about it later, uh, at a different time. For some reason, sci-fi games really yeah. resonate with me. Uh, and this one was no different. Uh, my only concern I had with the game was the choices for point values on some of the missions didn't seem to reflect the effort put into gaining them, but the game as a whole, uh, I'm right there with you. Yeah, I think you were you were more of a fan than I was of the original, because you still haven't tried the expansion yet. we got to get that in there at some point. Yeah, I was kind of disappointed when, when Ian had to, had to move yeah. on, and we couldn't jump right back into it and try it with the That was my goal. Expansion. My goal was to play two rounds. It's a quick game. It's it's almost lightning quick, like a surprisingly quick for the amount of stuff that's going on in that game. Now, after Horizons, uh, as Sean mentioned, Ian had other things to take care of. So it was just the two of us. Uh, well, the rest of the table was all playing Orléans, or the rest of the people, they were playing Orléans and something else. Uh, we played a two-player game of Azul, Summer Pavilion. 
I've been looking forward to doing that because I'd only ever played a four player at this point. And man, that was an enjoyable and very close game. Like I, I think I like it way better at two than playing with four. Um, I need to try it with three. Like at this point, I'm starting on one. I have a feeling three might even be better than four. Like maybe that's a two to three player game that can play four players. Yeah, I was a bit shocked as I sort of expected it to either be yeah, all right or brutally cutthroat. And it was yeah. neither. It was a good, fun game. And I absolutely preferred it from yeah. preferred two to four. Yeah, I expected like the original of the duel is really cutthroat two player. With that whole center market in that game, it's it's just not as punishing as the original. It's it's really hard to hate draft. Yeah. And I, I think I actually like that. Yeah, no, the, there's there's so many colors and so many potentials. And then the addition of the wild uh color yeah. each round is is what sort of takes the edge off that hate drafting. All right, after CG Realm, uh D and I took Sean to a new to us tequila bar. I think it's still fairly new. I think it only opened the last year or so i uh, had some mexican dinner at a place called the grand cantina i think that went pretty well they have some it, it's an interesting mix they have great food and okay food and we're just trying to figure out which is which like at, at some point there's going to be stuff where every time i go there i order the same thing and it's always great but there are some choices that i've I found suboptimal but then those are also the choices other people online have strongly recommended to me so i just think it's a taste a person-to-person taste thing yeah, it was hit and miss, uh, but uh, what was good was very good. Yeah, and nothing was terrible. It was just not not well, not worth it. I guess is what it would. It, it would. There was anything. Yeah. I, there was nothing I would turn my nose up at, but I don't think I would pay the price for it. Fair, fair. Uh, home full of taquitos, tacos, and churros. We decided to play one more game before calling it a night. Um, I personally said, Sean, what do you want to play? Because we talk about all these games on the podcast all the time. What are you excited about? And he really pushed that we work on the pile of obligations. So I do appreciate that. Uh, not everyone's always up for trying new stuff or playing those. So I broke out Pulsar 2849. Uh, this will be the first game we use the full rules, which include the asymmetric player boards and randomizing the end game goals and the technologies, which I didn't realize the technologies are really tied in to the others. Like you have to be using all of that. Man, did that change the game. Like I didn't realize how much of an easy mode the intro game is or the the first game the the starter setup where you use everything with a star on it because like pulsar is one of the most punishing games i played where you never have enough access like that's that's a feature of the game you it, it in many of these games you can't do it all and that you're not even going to get to do half of what you want to do and man with the full rules it's even worse like every base game i played there's three end game goals and i'd be able to hit two easy and usually three like oh yeah i got all those a long time ago there was no way that was happening in this game. Like, I got one. I think Deanna managed to hit two and didn't even realize she hit one of them. And I think you only hit one of them. Like, man, it was rough. Um, now, this one is in the pile of obligation. There will be a full review coming eventually, so I'm not going to spend a lot more time on this. Uh, I do need a few more plays, so I'll just stop my criticisms for now. Um, now, it was your first time playing this, and I do feel bad. Like, we really, for your first game, probably should have used that first game. I wasn't expecting that big a change. Uh, I think it would have been a little bit more new player friendly, but what'd you think of it? So I loved it. <laughs> I was terrified of it as you were setting it up and more and more pieces kept coming out around this board. You know, it's a big circle on the table and all of a sudden more and more things just getting, keep getting glommed on all the way around it. Uh, and in, depending on how you lay it out, this won't fit on a lot of tables oh. uh, because of the size of it. And everything you add on has more options and components and things to do, ways to spend your coin and ways to spend things. And there's just so much to focus on. But again, sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, and I went through the game and I think because of that overwhelming feeling at the beginning, I felt like you guys were just crushing me. And yet the final score, despite us all taking three completely different mm -hmm. paths, the game we all had three completely different experiences the total point spread at the end of the game was 10 points mm -hmm. so no it was good i i dig that game quite a bit the, the more i play it the more i like it so that was it with games with sean um he did stay until sunday morning we had some breakfast we talked some shop but that was it for gaming 
I do have to thank you for coming down. Like I said, that was like GameCon level of gaming, which was pretty awesome. That was a lot of games for one weekend, and not in 24 hours where you're stressed out by extra life or anything. Exactly. Just a lot of gameplay, so that was nice to do that more often. So then we move on to Monday night. I finally had a full house for the first time in 2020, possibly the first time in like six months. I don't know. I haven't been keeping track. Definitely the first time this year. We had a full house of all five players, which finally meant we could get to doing some role-playing games, which is what the group was founded to do way back in the day when we were playing uh, what started off as a D&D 4th edition group and turned into a Warhammer 3rd edition group years ago. We finally got everyone. Um, though I got to say, in this case, we didn't actually play an RPG because I got last-minute notification that people were coming, and I couldn't really prepare for that. But it did let us do some of the Session Zero work and make some characters. Now, I'm going to be running Dungeon Call Classic, so that meant making lots and lots and lots of characters, actually four for each player. Yeah, a lot of love from Twitter and Discord, as we have some real DCC fans who've been looking forward to this on your behalf. Uh, for people who don't know what DCC is, Dungeon Crawl Classics, this is a modern RPG that's attempting to recapture some of the joy and feel of old school dungeon crawling RPGs, right? Like original Dungeons and Dragons, obviously, Castles and Crusades and so on. What it does is it mixes modern mechanics with a very classic style of play that has a focus on discovery and exploration. It even goes so far as to require funky dice that you can only get from hobby stores which is something that like those of most of us gaming nowadays didn't have that experience of the dice being weird. Well, you get to actually have that again. It's one of those games that I'm always hearing about, but I really don't know anything about. <laughs> so one of the things unique, unique to Dungeon Crawl Classics is the concept they call the funnel. This is how each new campaign is meant to start. Players create a number of zero level characters. Now these characters are not heroes. These are mundane people, farmers, ditch diggers, traders, merchants, and so on. Not the kind of folk you expect to head into a dungeon crawl. These hopeless characters are tossed into a trap-ridden, monster-filled dungeon. It's only the characters who live through the, this first experience that go on to become first-level characters. Now, Monday, we made this band of miscreants, and next week, cross my fingers, we'll run them through their first funnel. The concept is just so perfect. It's the game that plays out what actually happens before you get to the players that we're used to thinking about starting in a role-playing game. Yeah. So now I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about DCC, but I will say the five of us had a lot of fun. Uh, it's 3D6 in order, lots of charts and stuff like that. And I got to say it was cool because I saw the players actually get invested in these silly little characters, right? The system worked, right? Like people had care, wanted to care about the characters. And what was cool too, is it was quick, right? That really didn't take that long. Like, we made 16 characters, and we still had time left. So, we actually played a couple more games. First up, I broke out Medium again. This is the chance to play with five players. Uh, definitely played better with five, though I am seeing one thing that I'm not sure on. One of the problems with the game, and I don't know if it's a problem, is you always are working with the players on your left and right. So, you're always trying to make that connection. And some people are going to grok this game better than others. Um, and some people are going to have better connections. I just think it might be more fun if after every round you swap seats. Though, yeah. I guess it's a short, quick game, so maybe you swap between rounds, but it just seemed like it, I'd be tempted to swap each round. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I know I connected with you through our lengthy experiences together. I mean, we've got a, you know, a, a massive history of, of shared experiences. Uh, and then D, I connected with on a very different level, uh, mm -hmm. very intellectually through our shared educational experiences. Um, and, but I could definitely see how some people, you would just struggle to find enough shared experiences through any means that you'd just yeah. kind of hit a blank and then you'd be in trouble, you know, you wouldn't be able to score on half your uh, game. Yeah, whereas if that's what one player has a problem with that, if they rotate around, everyone gets the equal amount, right? Um, one other interesting thing Deanna's mentioning in the chat is we did have a lot of fun, ton of laughs. Things got racy, which was kind of, I, in a way, good because it happened. Now, this isn't like we're playing one of those adult games. This is like when you're playing apples to apples and you happen to get two words. They're like, oh, I don't know what that means, right? The, it just kind of, the, the card combos go there. So it is worth taking a moment before playing to talk about limits and whether you want to go there or not. Uh, we did that mid-game because we didn't expect it to come up till it did. Once it did, we just had the conversation and we were all adults and we all agreed that it's fine. We're going to, we'll go adult with this. Uh, but it's yet again a board game where an X card might be appropriate during a, during a board gaming session. Overall, I'm digging it. Um, 
one more game. I know it's a lot. We talked about it. Um, that was Raiders of the North Sea. Uh, finally tried the Hall of Heroes expansion. It adds a bunch of Vikings, a new recruitment deck uh, to the recruitment tech, including a bunch of heroes. There's a new spot to go to, and there's quests. And what was neat about this, uh, this is another one I have to review. So I don't have to review it. I bought it. So <laughs> we probably will talk about it more as it keeps going, is wow, does it op open up the options? But wow, by opening up the options, does it add a lot of AP? And I don't know if it was just our group because we started late, what it was. But, like, this game was more than double the length of any other game of Raiders of the North Sea I've ever played. Like, it, it's not that it felt like it dragged. It just, Raiders of the North Sea is one of those games I've been able to fire off games in 45 minutes. And this was closer to three hours. So, still, first try of this one. I'll be looking at Hall of Heroes a lot more. A lot of people say it's a must-have expansion. I haven't made that determination yet. I will just say, but by adding just a few new options, there are a lot more choices. All right, well, how about uh, a look ahead? You got so many games in last yeah. weekend. Uh, what have you got planned for the coming week? I don't think I'll get as many games in, but you never know. Uh, easy mode this Saturday. Again, sorry it's past for those of you listening on the podcast, but for those of you live, uh, we're going to be at easy mode. The main thing I'm showing off there is medium. Uh, personally, I think it's a perfect venue. There are adult beverages available there. I think medium is going to play even smoother once people are slightly lubricated. We'll put it that way. I think it's a perfect game for that. Um, also going to bring Goris Maximus for the same reason Sean talked about earlier. It's a trick-taking card game, Euchre-like. It's, it's got that vibe where you just, you know, have a drink and play. Um, plus, I'll probably bring uh, Azul Summer Pavilion as another lighter and game that needs to get more plays. And I don't know what else. We'll see. All right. And then this Sunday, we got something pretty cool going on. This is going to be our first official game with a patron. We are going to be playing some Terra Mystica with Evil John Carney. And no, we're not streaming this one. This is just uh, the four of, four of us playing a game together. So that is uh, one of our new patron reward levels. If you want to play games with us, check us out at patreon.com. Yeah, and we don't stream everything we play. No, we do not. So yeah, we're going to be playing Terra Mystica with John. That'll be interesting. It'll be his first time playing, so that should be cool. Then the week after, February 22nd, this is our medium game night. This is the official game night where we are going to give away a copy. So come down to the CD Realm, try the game yourself, see it in person, talk about uh, Halloween bananas, and try to come up with a word that fits both Halloween and banana and see how it works out. Uh, one of the people who show up and play the game is going to walk home with a copy. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Duran Barnett, thanks. Jeff Seuss, you're in the chat so you know about this, but I'm finally going to run DCC, Jeff. <laughs> William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, you have breakout. John P. Kelly, from one Sean to another, thanks. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media. Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you dig the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop through our new and improved Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to go live on your podcatchers and YouTube every Tuesday at 2 a.m. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Fridays at 8.30 p.m. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on.